Well, good afternoon, everyone. As Adam mentioned, my primary focus is on threats to US elections that come from overseas and how that foreign interference impacts our election security, our domestic media, our social media, as we just heard a lot about from Sarah, and of course, our campaigns. To be very clear, our foreign adversaries want us to be divided and susceptible to this inflammatory information online. They want our system to be in chaos, that's their goal. So while we can't see many of these attacks, they're happening all the time. Earlier this afternoon, we heard from Kim Wyman, the election lead at CISA and the Department of Homeland Security. She said cyber attacks on our campaigns and elections are quote, wider and more pervasive than ever. The Department of Homeland Security actually warned about this threat in its June 7th bulletin outlining the current terrorism threat in the United States. DHS wrote, foreign adversaries remain intent on exploiting the domestic threat environment to sow discord, undermine US democratic institutions, and promote or inspire violence by their supporters. In order to achieve these goals, foreign adversaries have launched several types of attacks on our democracy. Cliff Newman discussed many of them earlier, and I'm going to go into a little more detail now. First, we've seen the hacking and public release of campaign documents by a hostile foreign entity with the goal of influencing an election in favor of a preferred candidate. Think WikiLeaks and the Clinton campaign or the DNC emails, which were hacked by a Russian organization working with Moscow's intelligence service. Those hacks and the emails released by them became a key topic in the 2016 election. You can see on this slide, the hashtag DNC leaks sign that I think actually someone's holding up at a Bernie Sanders rally. They became part of the campaign narrative. Second, we've seen public misinformation campaigns waged largely on social media designed to create division in our country. Foreign actors create fake accounts that appear to be real American voters, but they're actually trolls or bots those fake accounts then promote propaganda, conspiracy theories, or outright lies. They're often then shared by real people thinking that this information is true. This is where hostile foreign governments try to rile up Americans against each other and make us distrust our own elections outcomes by promoting these false conspiracy theories. Here's an example of that kind of attack on this slide. At 10GOP, this Twitter account, claims to represent Tennessee Republicans. But it turns out that this account was not affiliated with the state party or with any Tennessee Republicans at all. At 10 GOP was a Kremlin linked bot and the entity ended up being part of a federal grand jury indictment for essentially waging information warfare to help a preferred candidate. The account did this by posting inflammatory and inaccurate information and conspiracy theories all while the pretending to be an actual American political organization, and it wasn't. Third, we've seen the scanning and probing of voter registration rolls and other voter data by Russia. There's no public evidence this data was ever altered, but it's definitely an area that folks are keeping an eye on, a close eye on ahead of the midterms. There is, of course, the ever-present th threat of ransomware attacks by criminal groups tied to hostile foreign governments. There have been a lot of press stories about ransomware over the past few years. In general, these foreign ransomware attacks have been on the rise, and there's no reason to think that elections infrastructure or political entities or third-party vendors that you use for election-related work won't also become targets too. Finally, foreign intelligence services around the world are working to penetrate political campaigns across our country to gather information about candidates, even low profile candidates, that they can yet then use about and against American politicians who become our country's leaders. We'll hear more details about that a little bit later. Right now, as we meet today, US security officials are concerned about what foreign governments might do around the upcoming midterm elections, as I know all of us are on this call here today. Much of the concern centers around Russia and how it could exploit American divisions and seed false conspiracy theories about the integrity of our elections. Here's one example of a scenario that security officials are particularly worried about today. Russian hackers could breach a local county voter registration system. But here's the plot twist they actually want to get caught. They want to get detected. They would then post information and take responsibility, 
rather than blaming third party hackers like they did in 2016. Then other Kremlin backed forces would amplify the problems on Facebook and on Twitter with the goal of churning up these angry reactions and playing into this distrust that has been sown with the American public about the integrity and security of our elections. They wanna show that they can do it to make us believe that our elections aren't secure. Russia isn't the only country undertaking this kind of activity, but they're definitely the most prolific and the most aggressive that we've seen. Iran, China, and many others are also active in this space. For all of these reasons, elections infrastructure has been designated as critical by the US government, which allows DHS to provide prioritized cybersecurity services at the request of state and local officials. Everyone should take advantage of those. Each player in the elections business, and they're outlined on this slide here, the different components of elections infrastructure, each player on this slide represents a potential vulnerability for one of these kinds of attacks that I just mentioned. So the key question then is what can we do? Well, first we can use good operational security as we heard earlier from Cliff Newman, have multiple layers of security and not just one single point of failure. It's good advice for election security and also for personal security. Second, we can need to train ourselves, campaigns, political parties and elections officials how to detect foreign based disinformation, including how to spot bots, by doing things uh, like looking for hyperactivity, more than 50 to 60 tweets a day, or unlikely popularity for a very recently started account, or look for particularly odd English syntax, which maybe indicates it's not uh, someone uh, using their native language. On this slide is another example of this kind of bot. In August, 2017, an account called at Kirsten Kellogg posted a tweet attacking US media outlet ProPublica. It's a left, uh, tends to be a left-leaning uh, media outlet. This account had very low activity, only 76 followers, and was not following any other accounts on its own. But its post was retweeted and liked over 23,000 times. Chances are that that's not real and that it's coming uh, likely from overseas somewhere. These are the kinds of things to look for on social media and crucially to avoid sharing yourself. Tech companies also have to do more to combat the proliferation of disinformation coming from overseas on their platforms. They have civic responsibilities, these platforms, as they grapple with this disinformation that flourishes on many of their sites, much of which originates from overseas. There are many ways these companies can track where online information comes from, including that famous anecdote from 2016 about Facebook ads dealing with our election that were paid for in Russian rubles. The two ads on this slide were indeed two of those that were paid for in Russian rubles. Finally, we and our allies have to use whatever tools we have to pressure countries like Russia if they continue to meddle in foreign political systems or economic systems. As one expert wrote, you can see on this slide here, the full quote, this was a quote specifically about ransomware, but it applies generally to our election security uh, efforts. He wrote, purely defensive strategies will also fall short. Cybersecurity expertise is expensive and it's in high demand in the United States. It's unrealistic to expect that every American hospital, school, fire department, I would argue every elections uh, uh, outlet in the country, can defend itself against highly sophisticated criminals. The task is too big. This quote goes on to argue for a whole of government approach. And he says, the United States is capable of conducting successful campaigns of this sort to target the foundation of ransomware criminals operations. In this vein, the director of the National Security Agency, the NSA, who's also head of US Cyber Command, General Paul Nakasone, you can see him on the slide there. He said in an interview this week that, quote, we are going to be full bore against foreign interference and influence in our elections. He also said that he was very focused on whether ransomware specifically would disrupt the midterm elections and that right now the U.S. is conducting a series of operations to try and prevent that from happening. After the foreign interference in the 2016 election, Cyber Command, which is a relatively new combatant command uh, at the Defense Department, was given more authority con to conduct offensive operations overseas, targeting these cyber criminals. And he confirmed that his team conducted more than two dozen operations to get ahead of foreign threats before they interfered with the 2020 elections. 
few years ago. The Election Security Group, which is led by NSA and Cyber Command, and includes members from across the US government, is focused on doing the very same thing right now with future elections. So this is clearly a whole of government battle. Last year, the Justice Department announced aggressive actions against foreign hackers who had been involved in numerous high profile destructive ransomware attacks. It has also seized millions of dollars in funds traceable to these alleged ransomware payments. And just two weeks ago, the State Department said it would offer up $10 million to those who provide information on foreign interference in US elections as part of its Rewards for Justice program. This is a program that offers rewards uh, with information for information about um, terrorists, for example, or uh, uh, drug uh, organizations that operate internationally. And now they're using it uh, to combat election interference. This program aims to gather information that leads to the identification or location of any foreign person or entity who knowingly engage or is engaging in foreign election interference. These are exactly the kinds of tools the US and its partners are going to have to deploy to counter this threat, and they're doing so right now. Naming and shaming these cyber criminals is important. Depriving these organizations of the funds uh, that they use is also vital to these efforts. We did a lot of the same thing when we were countering um, Al Qaeda or terrorist organizations as well. We know how to do this. We have immense technical tools at our disposal, but a lot of the most important work happens at the state and local level with all of you on this call. We need to keep working to secure our elections and crucially not to sow doubts about the legitimacy of those elections. We cannot give these hostile foreign actors an opening to exploit. They've done it in the past and they, they will continue to do it if given the chance. We cannot give them that chance and that work falls to all of us. So thank you for joining today. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the conversation. And Adam, with that, I'll turn it back to you.